What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Midwest Outdoors Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jim O'Neill, brought to you by Fish Daddy. And hey, spring is in the air, and everything's moving and shaking now. Whether you're shed hunting, looking for morels or other mushrooms, chasing the walleye run, sturgeon run, or finally getting out on the boat for the first time and trying to catch a bass, spring is here, and so is the open water. And, well, spring turkey season, spring bird migration, there's a few things going in. And that is the awesome thing about this episode. We have a couple great guests that we're going to talk about a little bit of everything with, um, from Wisconsin all the way up to the Canadian border. And I think you guys are going to want to stick around because we have a lot of information this week. So let's get the show started because we had a couple fun things happen this week. So let's get right into it. First, we finally have official documentation that George Chance is now the official, not only state record, but now pending world record all tackle big head carp at 97 pounds. And my favorite thing about this, George was asked, what are you going to do with such a big fish after he decided to keep it? And he said, it's great fertilizer for my cucumbers and tomatoes. So, hey, for a carp, no better use for it. So I hope those are some of the best yielded tomatoes and cucumbers he's ever had. Besides that, I do want to I do want to tell everyone something real important real quick. Not in every state, but for most of our Midwestern states, it's time to buy a fishing license. And here in Illinois, it just happened. Wisconsin just happened. So go buy your license because I would be able to tell you guys about two other records that were caught in the U.S. over the last month, but guess what? Both records were revoked because the angler did not have a fishing license at the time that he caught it. Guess what, folks? If you catch a fish and then buy your fishing license, they'll figure that out. So listen, it only costs a few bucks if you're a resident, a little more if you're not a non-resident, but buy your fishing license. The money goes back into cleaning up our lakes, stocking fish in our bodies of water, and paying the DNR that, well, we know kind of understaffed and going through a lot these days, and we could help help our resources. So buy your fishing license, buy your hunting license, and get ready because we are gonna have an incredible 2024. Now besides the records, hit some tournament information real quick. Right now, we got two different big bass events going on. We got the MLF at Dale Hollow, and after day one, Illinois boy himself, Drew Gill, is in first again. He's had an incredible year, so can't wait to see how that tournament shapes up. And also, the Bassmaster Elite Series is down on the Harris Chain in Florida right now, and it's not gonna be your typical Florida event. The bites are tough, the fish are a little smaller than normal, it's just after post-spawn, and day one was already postponed because of 40 to 50 mile an hour winds and thunderstorms. So we'll see how those tor tournaments end up this weekend. Besides that, for you non-bass people, we do indeed have the NWT starting back up next weekend. They'll be in Port Clinton on Lake Erie in Ohio. And let me tell you, from some of the reports and some of the fish we've been showing you guys from Lake Erie recently, they are going to have a great event with some big weights. Hopefully real weights with no uh, lead in there. There's going to be some big weights caught and some awesome fish, so I can't wait to see what happens. And that's next weekend, April 18th and 19th in Port Clinton. So, hey, look up the information. I'm sure they got a nice little weigh-in and a festival going on. So if you guys are out over there, check it out. Currently in Wisconsin right now, they have a survey out because they are about to take a couple things to vote. Now, there's a lot of different things in this bill, but a couple of the things are itemized that I want to talk about with you guys real quick. They're talking about banning live scope and 360 forward-facing sonar, such like that. Now, again, do I think this is going to happen? I don't know. I doubt it. But if enough people say yes, it will happen. So if you are for keeping live scope forward-facing or 360, go take that survey. You know, Say that you want, you want it. It adds to your fishing. Another thing that's going on is federal at the federal level is they're talking about protecting sturgeon, lake sturgeon. 
um, which would mean they would take away all open seasons and it would technically be illegal to even target the fish. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit today about sturgeon and how in a lot of areas, they're not really even hurting. So does it make sense to make this fish federally illegal to target or should it be protected on certain bodies of water? Look it up on the Wisconsin DNR and take that survey. It won't hurt and it helps your voice be heard. That's all the news for the week. As always, I'll keep you up to date with anything that you need to know in the fishing or outdoor world. Now, speaking of what's going on right now in the outdoor world is the walleye run. Although we've talked about the walleye run up in Green Bay, the Rainy River, and other places, we haven't talked yet about the Maumee River run near Toledo, Ohio. So in fact, this week, we had our camera crew out in that area, boots on the ground, surveying what's going on. So real quick, I'm gonna kick it out of the studio to our guy, Dennis LaPelle, who was in the field. Hey guys, uh, Dennis LaPel, and we are out on the Maumee River in Maumee, Ohio, just outside of uh, Toledo, and I am with Brian Miller, one of the local pros, and uh, um, you know, we're, uh, we're checking out the walleye run. You know, this run is uh, pretty infamous, isn't it, uh, Brian? Yeah, it is. People come from all over the place to fish the Maumee. We were talking earlier and you said uh, in the past you've seen as many as, what, 26 different state license plates out here? <laughs> yeah, we definitely, people just come from all over India, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, are really big places, but people come as far as North Dakota, South Dakota to come into the here. So now this is a pretty famous run and it really just started popping off, didn't it, uh, in the last uh, week or so? Yeah, actually it's been, it starts slow in March, mm -hmm. uh, but really in the last week or two is when we've had a huge push of fish because the water came up, fish kind of push into the river. Yeah, you had a flood crest on Saturday, didn't yep, you? Yep, we did. Yeah, so oftentimes um, the mummy runs all the way down into Indiana. Mm -hmm. And so anytime we get rains that come from the west, uh, they fill up all the creeks and channels and it fills up the mommy. So usually we get a crest a couple days after it rains. Okay. Uh, and as the river came up, like this last time it came up nine feet over top of where it was, oh, wow. which is which is quite huge. It's on the way down. Right. And as the river kind of comes down, fish settle into pockets. And that's why the fishing is so good in the last couple days. Right, now I, I imagine also like with those rains and the spring melts and whatnot, that's what really triggers these fish to start moving up these rivers. It, it does, there's uh, the right time of the year. So any, yeah. always in the March. They've April. got one thing on their mind. They got definitely, they're coming up to spawn. Um, and then right now, particularly in the first week of April is the time where you'll see a lot of females move in. Mm -hmm. That's where if you're after a trophy walleye, you can come in and fish uh, the mommy at that particular time. Now you guys have very liberal limits out here, don't you? We do. The walleye population in Lake Erie is just booming. Oh, it's it's just unreal. Yeah, it's been the best that I, we've seen it in uh, a couple decades here. Right. Um, and so the limits have actually raised. We have six fish uh, uh, is a daily limit. Okay, and what's possession? Possession is uh, there's no possession limit. Oh, really? Yeah, so as long as it's frozen or uh, I'd have to look at the DNR to find out what Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put that info on the bottom of the screen. Yeah, totally, so as long as it's frozen and cut and put in your freezer, Okay, so fine. basically if you're coming up for five days, so off the top of your head, you're thinking yeah. six fish every day, Absolutely. clean them, freeze them, freeze them. Uh, and, uh, and go fishing the next day for as long as you're out here. And like always, you can always size up your fish, you know, as long okay. as you don't have any damage on your fish. Right. Um, you can catch your six, keep fishing. They're they're live, you know. Everybody's everybody's out here running with metal stringers, and you look down the line, and you know you got <laughs> it's a bandolier of fish hanging off of people. It's pretty uh pretty wild. Uh, now uh, this run, the uh, the, uh, the density of the walleye in the river gets so uh, amazing. You've been posting on your website or uh, on your Facebook group that you're seeing 20 minute limits. Yeah, we are. And actually yesterday was a phenomenal day. We came out uh, yesterday and caught 15 minute limits, which is just really phenomenal right it was insane and, and all perfect great eater size not not these little 14 inches that people say are perfect eater size and that just means that they're not catching them you know these are good 18 yeah. inches yeah they were they were really good all of our fish yesterday were 18 to 22 24 inches oh, unreal so, a fantastic fishing so and with that spring run it's it's like the perfect walleye fillet yeah it is now throughout the midwest you know a lot of people are throwing uh you know jigs and ringworms and moxies and paddle tails uh some blade bait but it's very specific type of rig that you're allowed to use here on the Maumee River. Uh, can you touch on that real quick? 
Yeah, absolutely. In the Maw Me, uh, we run inline sinkers or bullet weights. Okay. Um, and then we run a leader line that's usually anywhere between two and seven foot long. All right. A floating jig head and a two to three inch grub. Now, a lot of that is because, uh, you know, first of all, the density of anglers, but as well as you have a hook restriction. We do. We have a hook restriction of no more than a half an inch. Okay. So really size four or size two floating jig heads uh, are the best size. And, and only one hook, no trebles. Only one hook, um, one hook and one fishing pole. As you can see, we've got about uh, 75, 100 people down the, uh, the shoreline here. Everybody's catching fish. Everybody's having a good time. It's a great camaraderie. Um, you just kind of muscle your way in and you fish the, uh, the same way as everybody else. And uh, everybody works together and uh, you know, to catch a, a, a good, uh, good mess of uh, walleye flies. Yeah, it is. And everybody's great on the river. When you come down here, you think about a lot of people, but everybody's super friendly and super helpful. If you guys are looking for uh, current uh, fishing information, water reports, uh, Brian and his team are uh, posting daily uh, on the Mommy River group on Facebook. Yeah, so our Facebook group is Mommy River Walleye Run and uh, have a website that's also mommyriverwalleyerun.com. Perfect, I mean, that's the place to go when you're looking for update uh, date information for the Mommy River. Uh, so now we're gonna head back to the studio, Jim O'Neill. All right, Dennis, well, hey, thanks for that awesome insight on what's going on on the Maumee River. It was a great fishing report, and it looks like the fishing's a little different down there, but there's no shortage of fish to be caught. So, guys, we're going to take a real quick commercial break, and then we're going to be right back with our first interview. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. joined by clam pro staff member Callie Price and Callie you've been all over the Midwest it feels like this last month <laughs> yeah for the most part I get around uh, I try to but it's kind of hard with the puppy <laughs> absolutely hey but I'm sure the puppy helps you sometimes does he go out oh, and yeah. hunt with you oh yeah she is my sole purpose that's the only reason we went out to North Dakota because I wanted to get her out running we killed some snow geese. It was pretty decent. I've always wanted to go out and shoot some snow geese. You know, um, obviously you can hunt them in multiple different states, um, a little outside the Midwest. I've seen these shoots that they do out in like Arkansas where people have just so many of them. It's unbelievable. I highly recommend. I mean, spring is fun, but it's kind of hard hunting migrators going back north. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend the fall. It's the spins. It's just tornadoes of birds if you hit the timing right. Where I was in South Dakota, we had that snowstorm that passed through in South Dakota, and it kind of like put a stop to any migration north, which kind of sucked. But I mean, we still killed birds, and that's all that really matters. It was fun. Yeah. I go out there. I try to go out there every year, see my buddies that guide out there. Uh <laughs> It, but it was definitely a hard year. Now you had a picture of a bird. Now I'm not a I'm not a big bird hunter. Okay, I'll be the first one to say I'm a little ignorant to some of it. But you had a bird that was looking that looked pretty cool. Um, I think it's a blue. A blue, yeah. They are literally. I literally have one at the taxidermist right now. Yeah. Out of all snow geese and all the subspecies, they're my absolute favorite. Is like a fully mature blue goose. Ugh, I don't want to play right now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry no you're fine what's um, um what's some of the differences on those blues that you that you can see the differences between like a regular your regular basic species snow goose is they're all white bodies and they've got black tips on their wings they're kind of like a seagull with a long neck pretty much um yes. the blues they've got like gray wings and then they've got like 
uh, a bald, like a bald eagle head almost where the head is white. Um, oh. And they've got gray wings and more of a, a white chest. You can definitely tell a difference. Um, it was kind of hard because they were guiding um, out there. So it's people that usually we had a whole group of girls that had like never hunted snows, brand new, which was really fun. But they didn't know the difference between speckle bellies and blues and snows and all the different species. So we could only shoot birds that were only packs of snows. And they were just really confused about that. But hopefully they learned something. Hopefully. But yeah. that is one big thing about the spring is you can't shoot speckle bellies during snow season, obviously. That's why fall is a lot easier because you can't shoot them. So it's not as big of a deal. So you can shoot in those big packs, which is the best ever. <laughs> you know, that is a slight worry of mine when it comes to shooting birds, because like I said, I haven't done a whole lot. Um, you know, a pheasant, that's bird I've shot. You, you know what, what a pheasant is. <laughs> when yeah, you see, you know really screw that up. <laughs> but, and when it comes to fishing, right, if something's out of season, you, you, you catch it, you see it, you release it, right? If you shoot something out of the sky, there's no releasing. So it's, the hardest thing with that is just like trying to tell them like, cause if you shoot it, we're going to report it. And I tell everyone beforehand, it's a misdemeanor, a class B mis misdemeanor in North Dakota, shoot a bird out of season. That's what we were told by the wardens there. Sure. And it's like, if you don't know, don't shoot. Simple yeah. as that. Yeah. It's better to not do it than to make a mistake that you're going to regret. I think that's great advice there. You know, um, a lot of people, I think, like to try to get some type of advantage in hunting, because let's be honest, hunting's hard. Hunting's hard when you are around oh. areas with a lot of people, like here in Chicago. I mean, the, if people go out and they want to find hunting close, and there's only so much, especially for public land, you know. But hey, it's just not worth it, you know. That's with any species, pretty much. If you're not sure what you're shooting at, don't shoot it because there'll be more birds. You'll get better at identification. I mean, I struggle with it all the time, especially like earlier in the morning or when it's hard to see the sun's right in your eyes and you're not sure what it is. I mean, you have no idea at that point. I mean, there's, I've met some guys two miles away. They can tell you what that bird is and they're going to be right. And some people it's like, I'm newer. I've only been doing this for like three years or so. Okay. If I don't know, it's not even worth it because you don't know what you're shooting. It's biggest thing there is like, know your birds. <laughs> I got, I literally made flashcards. There you go. Of all the birds and the species. And I would go through them all the time. And I like took pictures of them far away. So I knew their body shapes. And I was like, we're going to know this. Now, speaking of spring hunting, uh, something is coming around right around the corner in our area. And that is turkey hunting. Are you going to be out there chasing a, chasing a bird this year? Uh, what really bums me out is I got uh, picked for first week this week, year. And I was so pumped. And I'll be at work in Iowa for the first week. But I bought some bonus tags, so we'll see what goes on there. I prefer to hunt earlier the season like everybody else, but a bird's a bird. Doesn't matter where it is. I've been out and about. I got a little bit of permission around here for hunting, but we'll see how it goes. I'm not very stealthy. That's why I picked all the good sports that you don't have to be stealthy. Duck hunting don't have to be very stealthy. You just got to hold still for a little bit and yeah. fishing, obviously you don't have to be stealthy. <laughs> hey, there's, but if you... there's fishing applications where you should be a little stealthy. <laughs> yeah, but not as much as sitting completely still turkey hunting. Cause I have been busted quite a bit. Ugh. I have a little bit of a hard time sitting still. We're working on it. We're working on it. Yeah. Hey, I got the ADHD brain. I get it. You know, it's it's all over the place. Oh, yeah. Especially when I hear a crunch or something behind me. I'm like, don't look. Don't look. I don't know what it is. Don't look. It's usually a squirrel, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect, perfect time to enter the ice age bit, you know, squirrel. Uh, yeah. Literally. On the dog. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> So, all right. So that's hunting. Um, you know, I hope you get a bird, but I did want to talk to you because I was impressed with some other stuff going on too, because it seems like you're, you're really hitting all the outdoor stuff right now. Um, 
you know, I've been shed hunting now for four years and I've been morel hunting for five. And, you know, when you're, when you're out in the woods looking for mushrooms, a lot of the times you could stumble upon a shed, you know, or, or some cool stuff. I found some cool cans. I found cool bottles. I've even found a fossil, but in five years of being in the woods now, I have not found a single shed. And oh, wow. <laughs> I know. And I see that, you know, you, you're finding some by your house. You're even finding some out in North Dakota. So here's my question. We're not going to spend too much time on this, but what do you look for? What is what what is uh, something you look for to start your process, to start your search? So first off, I'm looking for where the deer are wintering. You know, when you drive by, you see 50 freaking deer standing in a field. They're wintering there. They're feeding there. The biggest things are where they're bedding down, where they're traveling, where they're eating. That's the that's where they're going to be. Most of mine, I found um, bedding areas is a big thing for me. Um, there's some property around here. They've got fields, cornfields. They have grassy knolls that mm -hmm. aren't tilled out. And I'll find them on top of those because they've been bedding down up in there. Uh, I found pretty much all my sheds this year on on stuff like that. Uh, fence lines with brush where they're traveling through. They nick one off right there. It's pretty easy. And the deadhead I found here, in, the one that I found here in Wisconsin, it was in the middle of a field in the middle of nowhere. Just happened to find it. The dog is absolutely no help. She's definitely just a bird dog. <laughs> She's there for exercise. And uh, out, out in North Dakota, I, I've never been. I wasn't in the best spot, um, but I was bored and it was noon and we were taking lunch break from hunting and resetting fields and everything. And I was like, you know what? I'll just go wander around some of the property we have permission for. I walked like a mile and I found a row of um, pine trees and I was like, this is excellent. Excellent. And I found a whole bunch of other bones and I was like, Ooh, this is looking good. And then I just stumbled upon it. I, I was, I was shook because <laughs> i could use it was a nice 10 point buck and yeah the, the person that owns the property said they had it on camera which is kind of bummed from last year but i mean at least i found it and i can bring it home and decorate my house <laughs> there you go so i mean it's mostly just where they're traveling you got to be on those deer paths usually i keep my my eyes about 10 feet in front scanning in front of me because usually it's not going to be directly in front of you. It'll be thrown somewhere. You know, they shake their head and they throw it. Yeah. I'm not the best, but I'm getting there. <laughs> All right. So we got hunting, we got sh kind of hunting and shed hunting, but you've also been hunting after some big fish this year and someone just wants a little camera time. That's all. I know. You seem to have kind of gone around with the wacky weather we've had this year. If it's hot, it looks like maybe you've been chasing some shallower fish like bass or yeah. but if it's miserable and a Midwest spring like it normally is, um yeah. it's been really conducive to catching some big walleye this year too. We my boyfriend, he is the walleye guy. I I like walleye, but I prefer my bass. He hates bass. It's a very interesting relationship we have. Uh but I I I love it. Uh, I got my first over 30 this year. So that was big. Uh, it was 13.5 pounds. It's yeah. Very you large. You understand that's like a very, very seldomly caught size fish. I yeah. Mean no, we were freaking out. It was like the middle of the night. It was, I thought it like, I saw it through the water because the water was so clear. And I was like, that is, that's, that's a carp. That's that's not a wall. That's a car. <laughs> and they're like, it's huge. And I was like, it's huge. I won't I won't ask you everything about it, but were you trolling or casting? We were trolling. It yeah. was it was a pretty slow night all in general. But I mean, it's just that one fish that can change everything. And that's kind of what makes it worth it on those slow days. Were you lower <laughs> were you lower in the bay or more up in the bay? <laughs> I can't give away the trade secrets. Uh, we were we were lower in the bay for the most part, yeah. but we were we've been all over, literally all over. We're just chasing pods of fish like everybody else. It's they've been moving. Hopefully, I'm, 
planning on river fishing this uh this <laughs> weekend down it's really cool because people you know it again yes there has been some slow tough days but there's been giant fish and numbers from Marinette down to Ocano to the Fox. I mean, it's, it kind of seems like you can catch them really anywhere you find those shallower transitions and the rivers. Yeah, wherever you, you just got to look for pods, man. Drift over pods. It's the biggest thing, especially if you're casting. I mean, it's been a learning experience for me, so... I, I'm not going to say I know it all, but I mean, I know enough at this point to be successful. And it, I, it's just looking for fish. It's the same thing with looking for sheds. Look for them fish and you'll find what you're looking for. So, well, listen, we'll let you get going in a minute. Uh, what's one thing you're looking forward to this spring coming up? Uh, I think my goal for this year in general, we'll just throw it at that because I try to set a little goal. I think my goal is to actually catch a muskie. I have never caught a muskie ever. And I think that's my goal for the year in general. (laughs) I do one goal every year. Yeah, No, that's, that's awesome. That is awesome. Um, Hopefully you can knock it out early so you can add another goal, you know? I know, right? It's little steps. (laughs) <laughs> my goal is the 30 incher this year. That is like one of my big goals. Um, so we got a we got a 20, we got a few 26s, you know. Um, so we we still need to up our game. So that's why we're gonna fly back up there this Sunday and try. Hey, the more you fish, the more chances you get. That's that's why I'm fishing all the time, <laughs> literally all the time. I, and that's hey, we love it. We love people like you out in the woods, out on the water and you know, not only making content, but helping others enjoy it and doing what you love the most. So if someone wants to check out what you're doing and where you've been, um, where should they look? Uh, I post most of my stuff on Instagram. I'm not too big in everything, but, you know, I love sharing my content and I love sharing what I love. And that's, you know, outdoors. Uh, It's just my name, Callie Price on Instagram. Pretty easy going. (laughs) There you go. All right, everyone. Well, hey, a nice little wrap up from Wisconsin and the Dakotas or anywhere Kelly goes. But hey, Kelly, <laughs> thanks for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you again sometime on the pod. All right. Thank you. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at mwomag.com. That's mwomag.com. We are back and we are joined by a buddy of mine, some known, some known as Coho Joe, aka Joe Al Tweef. Might have said that right. Might have said it wrong. Joe oh, Altweef. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, Joe. Hey man, I just want to tell everyone first a little backstory. I don't even know if you know this, but um, you know, I started following you a few years ago, I think three years ago now, because I was like, man, this guy's catching some big coho in Wisconsin. And I love big coho. And then the funny thing is, this is the part you probably don't know, is I was also following this photography page that I really liked. And lo and behold, it's the same person who makes both pages. And that's that's where I started learning the legend of coho Joe. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, those are uh, those are definitely my two passions is uh, fishing and photography. And it's cool because they kind of align sometimes too, which works out. But yeah, they really do. Um, you know, people who aren't fishermen, really, they don't understand how I can go out from sun up to sundown multiple days and just always be content and not bored and stuff. And it's like, listen, sometimes the fishing's terrible. And of course that gets brutal, you know, 
But half of being out there for me is just being out there and seeing. Of course. And that's one thing that fishing and photography totally have in common is that there's a lot more days where things don't work out than the days where the stars align. And it's, you know, incredible whether you're hunting, uh, you know, chasing fish or hunting a, an awesome photograph, it kind of boils down to the same thing of being in the right place at the right time, which means you got to spend a lot of time doing it. And every once in a while, the stars align. We're not going to talk about coho today. Maybe in the fall. Maybe we'll bring you back down south for the fall, okay? But these days, you're living up on Lake of the Woods, correct? Yeah, yep. I moved up here in 2021, so a little over two years I've been living here now and uh, guiding for Borderview Lodge on the south end of the lake. Shout out to Borderview Lodge, friends of the Midwest Outdoors. Mm -hmm. How's my boy Greg Jones doing? You run into him up there at all lately? Um, he was on the boat um, a couple days this summer. We had a couple good days. We fished with uh, the World War II veterans on the boat, which was just a couple special days having those guys on the charter boat. We ended up taking them up to Young's Bay and taking some pictures at the buoy up there, you know, the northernmost points of the of the lower 48. And uh, it was pretty special having them on the boat, something that I'll definitely never forget. Great outreach to the community and giving back to the people that gave the most to us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's jump into it. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot down here about this whole Green Bay and all the walleye coming in the rivers and stuff. But there's also another huge movement of walleye, not Erie, not Green Bay. And that is your area, Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River. Yeah, this time of year on the Rainy River, it's just it's a special place this time of year. You know, you got all the sexually mature walleyes charging up river and going to go make the next generation. And, you know, luckily we, we get to target them. You know, it's a catch and release season. Um, but your chance is that, you know, official lifetime, you know, other than the places that you just mentioned are probably higher than, you know, almost anywhere else. So it's a, it's a pretty incredible fishery for sure. I, I think I saw two different, uh, two different Instagram posts yesterday of uh, Brett McComas and someone else was up there and they're catching mm -hmm. 80, 100 fish a day. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They're whack. And there's just, there's so many fish in the system. It's ridiculous, but it's, it's awesome time of year to be up here. Obviously this year ice out was a little earlier than normal. Yep. Um, but when does that run uh, typically, typically go for how, how long does that last usually um you know we're catching you know large walleyes even uh you know even in the beginning early ice you'll have some large walleyes that have moved into the system so really all winter long you know and it, you're gonna have those big trophy fish in there from early ice all the way there'll still be some fish hanging around you know by the time that uh catch and keep season opens you know on that uh what is it march april may the second week of second week of may there so you know there's a there's a pretty big span of time of course right now it's kind of the hot and heavy uh season but there's a pretty large chunk of the year where you can catch some really big walleyes in the rain your river obviously there's a lot of sauger in the lake of the woods chain do you get those sauger moving with the walleye in the rainy yep you'll catch saugers along with your walleyes as well um mm -hmm. you know doing the same thing but and what are some of the techniques that are working well up there right now so my favorite way to fish this time of year, um, and it's, I really enjoy it because it's, it's basically the best time of year to fish this way is that I like going to the Canadian side and fishing with plastics. Um, yeah. and when I'm going to do that, you know, I'll be trolling up river, you know, slowly trolling from anywhere from 0.3 to 0.6 against the current pitching jigs with plastics. Um, and what I really like to do is I'll have my forward facing sonar perpendicular to the boat pointed out the side. So it kind of gives you, you're not necessarily going to watch your jig fall every cast, but you know, you kind of get to see where the fish are laying, you know, throw a cast out there, watch your line, watch that jig hit the bottom. And then we're pretty aggressive snap jigging those plastics off the bottom, letting them fall back down. And, you know, the real key to that is, every time you rip that jig up as it's sinking again you have to kind of have a conscious decision in your brain of did i hit the bottom or did i get a bite 
And, uh, you know, you have to make that decision maybe eight, nine, uh, you know, times in one cast. Um, and it's just an exciting way to fish, you know, it almost fishes more like, you know, like bass anglers, um, fish. So it's just, you know, I love having a rod in my hand, working a bait, you know, convincing a fish to bite is just so satisfying. So, you know, of course there's many other ways to catch them right now, um, in the rainy river, but you know, throwing plastics and snap jigging just for me personally, you just can't beat it. And when they want it, they crush it. And that's always fun too. I mean, only time you have a big fish crush a bait, I don't care what it is. It's exactly. So speaking of big fish, all right, because we've already talked a good amount about walleye and I know next show we're going to be talking about walleye. You, you have a, you have a different creature that you like a lot. I love sturgeon fishing. I cannot get enough of it. It's, uh, you know, that's the other species at this time of year is migrating up the rainy river. They're going to go do their thing in about another month here. They'll start spawning. Um, and right now, as those fish are migrating up the river, it's probably one of, you know, we can target them. We target them through the ice. Um, you can target them in the springtime. Um, and then their season will close down um, coming up here. Um, a couple days after uh, walleye season opens back up, um, I think it's May 15th is the last day this year that you can target them. And then they'll open back up again on July 1st. So we really get to target them for a big portion of the year. Um, yeah. But springtime is uh, definitely, you know, you just have higher concentrations of fish and uh, probably some of the best bites that you can get in all year long. I have limited sturgeon experience. You know, we don't have a whole lot in Chicago. Um, are we doing, are you doing the same thing that someone would do in the fall or summer with a glob of worms or some cut bait or how are you fishing these fish? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, standard sturgeon practice is going to be a no roll sinker um, compared, you know, with about an 18 inch leader and a circle hook. Um, I've kind of abandoned the status quo recently um and i won't go too into that but um most people would kind of be surprised that i've gone away from circle hooks um and that's a pretty standard you know 99 percent of the boats out there are going to be running circle hooks um and i've kind of shifted gears away from circle hooks and i think that's part of what's leading to uh to my success you know one of the other things that i think it's underestimated with sturgeon is you have a very large fish but a very light bite um so being able to detect bites you know and then being able to set the hook as soon as you detect a bite um can really lead to some high productivity days um which kind of there's a couple factors that go into that and the other large factor is choosing the amount of weight that you're fishing with is something that i think is being very overlooked on the average you know sturgeon boat on the on the rainy river you know if you're fishing heavy current sure you need heavy weight but like you know this year we have low water up here the river's not pushing very hard you have slow current um and matching your weight to your current speed is probably one of the most overlooked and most important factors when targeting these fish when i'm fishing finicky bass or something like that if they can feel that extra weight, they might drop the bait. Whereas if you can keep it fairly light and make them not be able to detect that they're being restrained. Exactly. And sturgeon are the same way. If they've got something kind of goofy going on, they don't like it and they'll drop that bait. And, uh, you know, obviously we're targeting fish that could be, you know, upwards of 80 pounds. So you're fishing with heavy gear. Um, and that's kind of unavoidable, but still being able to detect a bite wall fishing heavy gear is kind of where you start to dial some things in um and it can make a make a really big difference in your success now i was laughing because we did try to plan we tried to get some we tried to get a sturge through the ice it didn't happen this year maybe next year but i was laughing because i texted you about what kind of gear i should bring up and because I was in a hurry, I didn't see the text before I did. I just went ahead and did it because I didn't hear from you soon enough. And I was like, all right, well, for my walleye fishing, I'm fishing a 500 size reel with like 10 pound braid. 
So I said, what should I do for the sturgeon? So I said, you know what? A 2000 size reel with 30 pound braid should be great. And I get a text from Joe saying, yeah, pretty much bring your saltwater gear down here, Jim. <laughs> yeah, when we're fishing, I fish a little lighter um, through the ice. Um, but I'm fishing, you know, 4,000 size reels, 60 pound braid, which, you know, even 60 pound braid, I've had them, had them break, you know? So when I'm fishing open water, I'll fish a little heavier. I'm fishing. Basically I just take my, uh, my musky reels and I put them on a sturgeon rod for the springtime, which works out pretty well because we're not targeting musky this time of year anyways. Um, so once we, once we're fishing them open water, you know, you're fishing your big 400 size, uh, bait casters, 80 pound braid, you know, spooled all the way up. And, uh, even with that, you got to get ready for a ride because they, uh, they fight, you know, that's the other misconception. When I tell people about sturgeon fishing, they're like, well, it's probably like reeling in a log and they're not, <laughs> they are a very oh, very sporting they go for long runs they jump um they'll you know you'll be going doing laps around the boat uh, they don't just kind of hang on the bottom they uh they go nuts um and that makes it even more fun obviously that's really incredible you know i i understand they're not quite the same fish but you know you see those footages you see the footage of the british columbia sturgeon coming out of the water and it's yeah. just it's mesmerizing. There's nothing yep. like it out there. Yep. Yeah. And I, especially when you target them, you know, when it opens back up in July and you're targeting them in, in warm water, you know, I mean, I've had them come all the way out of the water next to the boat and you're getting splashed by the sturgeon that you're fighting. And it's like, there's just nothing like, it. I mean, for freshwater fishing, it, it's something that's really special. So Joe, you've been fishing. You've been fishing for these sturgeon for a few years now since you've been up there. What have you really learned about them? And is uh, there some history that's helped you kind of target them and find them? That's one thing that I think is so fascinating about the Rainy River sturgeon is the history of this population because it's just kind of a up and down roller coaster since the since the turn of the century. You know, we're talking late 1800s, early 1900s. You know, they were commercially targeting these fish, um, you know, for the eggs, for caviar. Well, you have to imagine only females have eggs, obviously. Well, a female sturgeon will only spawn once every five to six years, um, which kind of makes sense when you think of how long they live, that their evolutionary traits are for them to be alive for a long time. So if you had a couple million babies every year, you're birthing your own competition for food sources right so it, it kind of makes sense um but because of that you have to kill a lot of sturgeon to get some sturgeon with caviar in them so overfishing was um you know obviously we're talking you know well over 100 years ago um mm -hmm. and they basically knocked them out um and the the cool part about that is you know we went from completely eliminating the sturgeon you know which is you know obviously devastating to the you know the local um you know fishery obviously back in the day it was a lot different than it is now and then you had factories on the river that were polluting the river so even when they stopped commercial fishing for them it took a long time for the population to recover so it wasn't until the clean water act in the 1960s that cleaned up the rainy river and allowed the population to recover now what's so cool about that is there's nobody alive anymore that remembers these magical days when they were, you know, netting them and they were stacking them like cordwood on the shore. But now we have such a major population that we're kind of living in the good old days. Whereas in most fisheries, you know, you'll talk to your grandpa or your uncle and they'll talk about the 80s or 90s or whatever it was and all the fishing was so amazing. But yeah. what's awesome is we are living in some of the best sturgeon fishing times, you know, within the past, you know, 100 years on the Rainy River, which is really exciting. Um, and the kind of very ironic part about that is, you know, it was federal regulation that helped save this population. 
And now the feds are talking about an overreaching, you know, and uh, putting the lake sturgeon on the endangered species list, which would end, you know, targeting them and angling for them. So it's kind of a very ironic situation that the feds kind of helped us back in the day. Now we have this incredible fishery and now it's being threatened by the feds. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of an ironic story, um, you know, and, and even in the past several years, the amount of big fish that you are seeing has only increased, you know, from, oh yeah, fifties are big ones to, okay, now sixties are big ones to, well, if you didn't catch one over 70, you didn't catch a big one. And that's all just in recent history. You know, this wasn't happening 30, 40 years ago. This is happening today, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, I feel like we're taking part in this kind of dramatic history of the lake sturgeon in present day, this is going to be something that they're talking about, you know, so it's, it's, it's really neat situation. And, uh, hopefully, um, you know, the, hopefully they don't get uh, endangered because we have just an abundance of them in, uh, in the rainy river. My clients and I caught over 30 yesterday. Um, our biggest was 65 inches. We caught two tag sturgeon, um, which is, you know, really awesome for my clients that they'll be able to send that information into the DNR um, and they'll even get, you know, a, a certificate that says, you know, their name and, and their fish. And, you know, and it was the one lady's first sturgeon ever was a 65 inch tag sturgeon. And, and she'll always have a certificate that, you know, is kind of a keepsake for that catch, which is just so awesome. No, that is really cool. That's really cool. How big? What's the biggest one you've seen caught up there? Um, I've seen fish in the low 70s range, um, you know, 70 to 72 inches, um, which those are big fish. You know, you're talking fish that are knocking on 100 pounds. Yeah, so if there's if there's 90 pound, 100 pounders swimming out there, there's a 120, 130 somewhere out there. I would love just like one time if I could just – let God just look at me. Let's just let me see the one biggest sturgeon. If I could just see her once, just get a, just get a glimpse of her. I would probably never come off the water again. You don't even have to catch it. You you, you just want to see it for a second. I just want to see it because I'm pretty sure it would be a sight to behold for sure. I was on the Wisconsin river years ago and you know, they tell, they say out there, you know, 50 to 70 pounds, you know, that's going to be your giants. Mm -hmm. But I was younger. Fish look bigger sometimes in the water and when they get away. But I'll tell you what, that fish in my brain looked almost as big as the John boat I was in. And <laughs> that would have been a, close to a state record. You know, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's oh. there's a lot of things that swim in the water that we don't know about. Right. That's what I always think about. If we're catching, you know, 70 to 80 pounders as regularly as we are that one exceptional fish i i can't even imagine how big she is but she's in there somebody will get her one day for sure especially with live scope you know <laughs> yeah yeah that's the other thing you know that i uh has just been such an instrumental tool for me in how i high sturgeon fish you know and when we think of live scope and we think of watching a bait fall on a fish and and working that bait and, and triggering a strike right but when we're sturgeon fishing with live scope it's much more based on the observations that i've been able to make by watching these fish in real time seeing how they act and seeing the different things they do and when you spend as much time watching sturgeon on live scope as i have you wouldn't believe some of the things that these fish do for example when we're ice fishing there's been many, they do it regularly. You will watch a fish slide into your spread. If you make noise, if whatever happened and those fish are, eh, something's not right. I mean, you're talking about an old smart fish, right? They don't even spin around in a circle and swim away. They will put it in reverse and swim backwards and swim out of your spread. And if I hadn't seen it as many times as I've seen it, I wouldn't believe it. The other thing that they'll do, which is is mind boggling to me, really is you'd think fish that are higher in the column, you'd think, okay, those fish are passing through. We're not going to catch those fish. 
Mm-hmm. I've seen fish 10, 15 feet above your bait. Come turn, see, notice whether they're smelling it. I believe they're smelling it, um, smelling it or seeing it, whatever they're doing. You know, almost like what you'd imagine a predator to do. They will come up above that bait. They will notice your bait and in a hurry, swim down to the bottom and eat that bait. And if you weren't watching those fish do that on live scope, I mean, you would never believe how aggressive they can act at times. It's actually insane. And they, you know, they love to jump when you're ice fishing for them. They'll be swimming right underneath the ice. They are just such a fascinating fish. And be, when you don't get to watch them on live scope and you don't get to understand those things about them, it's really easy to have a lot of misconceptions about how they're behaving. You know, oh, it's a bottom fish. They're always laying on the bottom. No, these fish use the entire water column. They're going to eat even if they're higher in the water column. I mean, it's just fascinating to me. And that's part of kind of what created my obsession with them is seeing how they behave and realizing that a lot of things that guys are telling you about them, it's not necessarily based in fact. And you couldn't necessarily prove that until you're watching them in real time. And once you see it with your own eyes, it's, it's pretty special. I mean, I just learned a couple of things just now when you were talking, you know, obviously I know they don't spend their whole life on the bottom. Um, but when you think about the fish, right, flat stomach made for sitting on the bottom, feeder on the bottom of the head on the bottom. So they mm-hmm. feed on the bottom. But um, when you think about it, yes, sturgeon break water, they jump, you know, oh, wow. it, and it's kind of wild. And I, we're talking not when they're hooked, you know, just for for fun. I think they're just doing summersaults salts out here. It's, uh, my customers normally ask me when when we're sitting there targeting them and uh and there's fish flashing all around us. They they like to ask, you know, why are the fish jumping? And there's a lot, you'll hear a lot of answers from a lot of guys. Uh, my go-to line is, it's because they don't have a middle finger. And that's what they're doing when they're jumping is letting you know they're here and, and they're not biting. So. <laughs> yeah, we don't like your lines all over. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Joe, hey, I appreciate you joining. And before I let you go, I did want to mention something. So up at Borderview, you know, that area, um, obviously title sponsor of our show is Fish Daddy. And uh, you don't work with Fish Daddy, but I, I, you told me you got to use some this year. What would you think of those baits up there? I'll tell you what, you know, you're fishing up here in stained water, especially ice fishing. You got a couple of things going on. Once we get farther, you know, out into the lake in the mud, you're fishing deep, you know, around 30 feet of water. You get to midwinter, you've got a pie, you know, this last year was an exception, but on a normal year, you could have two, three, even more ice feet of ice, you know, then you end up with snow on top of it. It's dark down there. You know, there's not a lot going on and fish are naturally curious. You know, they want something to, oh, what's that? You know, I'm, I'm 20 feet away, but I see something over there. You know, I want to come check that out, you know, and that's why we fish glow. Right. And that's why we fish rattles. And there's a bunch of different ways that we kind of cue in on that. But I'll tell you what, having one of those fish daddy jigs down the first time that I fished with one with other guides. Yeah. They were getting frustrated because they were catching fish. I got in the house with the fish daddy jig and I was just catching the fish were all coming over to me. And that's kind of how I've kind of dialed in on using it is I like to dead stick them. Um, and I really think that you just draw fish in with that jig. So, so whether I catch them on the jig, which sometimes they're absolutely pounding it, um, or whether I catch them, you know, on my jig stick not on my dead stick where i'm running the fish daddy you mark more fish you know they they come over to you you can make somebody else in the house pretty frustrated if they don't have one on when you're marking all the fish and they're not because they want that they want to relate to that they're curious um and this past season even with less ice um and less snow they were still some of the hottest jigs on the lake i i gotta admit it (laughs) I had a feeling you'd say something like that. So I just... <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, we'll make sure you have some more for next season. All right. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. So, and hey, Joe, if anyone wants to check out what you're doing or if they want to book a trip and come fishing with you, how can they find you? 
Yeah, so I'm uh, Coho Joe on Instagram. It's coho.joe. Um, that's a really good way to get a hold of me. Follow me on there. Shoot me a DM on there. Um, we'll get something set up. And uh, I'd love to go fishing with, with anybody who wants to go learn about sturgeon, you know, and learn how we target them. You know, it's, it's awesome. So what other fishing do you do besides the sturgeon? Um, I also guide walleyes. Um, and then my personal fishing, I do quite a bit of musky angling as well. So, all right. Well, guys, you heard it. Coho Joe. Yeah. And also they can call Border View, right? If they want to come. Yeah, up. sure. Yeah. Give Border View Lodge a call. You know, we run uh, ice fishing all winter long. We run uh, 27 foot sport crafts in the summer, which is just an awesome day trip. You know, come up, catch a bunch of eater walleyes. We'll clean them. We'll clean them up for you. Cook them up for you in the lodge. Everything's included. You know, just bag, bring yourself and, uh, you know, make sure you got some good clothes for the day and, that's pretty much it. We'll take care of the rest. So it's an awesome deal. The scenic views, great fishing, and a shore lunch prep for you that day. It doesn't get can't much. can't beat it. You can't it beat it. Much. All right, Joe. Well, hey, I'm going to let you go. Thanks for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll get up there maybe this summer. We'll chase some summer fish. Sounds good. Thanks, Jimmy. I will talk to you soon. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at mwomag.com. That's mwomag.com. Something about spring just really gets me going. I am an Aries, so maybe it's that April weather in the air, but you know, spawning bass, spawning walleye, sheds are dropping, morels are starting to pop up. I love spring. Speaking of spring, something about soft plastics and bass fishing just makes sense. So a few weeks ago, I was in Madison, Wisconsin, and Big Mouth Fishing sent me a couple of these baits, or rather gave me a couple of these baits. And I don't know about you guys, but I want to show you this because it's not often I see something that is done differently or better than most. This is called core shotting a bait. And if you look at that, that color runs right through the middle and is laminated on the outside with a different color. In this instance, it's clear. So you have a clear outside with a pink inside. But they told me one of their top selling baits is their watermelon. And you can see, very similar to that, but with a light green outside. And these are little changes that the average angler isn't throwing. Um, and this can give you a competitive advantage to catch a fish because they've never seen something that looks exactly like this. So if you guys want to check out baits that are a little different, especially the Core Shot Sanko that's made by Big Mouth. I would highly recommend checking these out, guys. They're really soft, they're tough. So hey, Big Mouth Fishing out of Wisconsin. Check them out and I hope this year they help you catch a few more fish. Alrighty, everyone. Well, hey, that's another heck of an episode of the Midwest Outdoors podcast. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. I wanna thank all the guests we had on today, as always, this show isn't possible without the guests, without Fish Daddy, everyone here at Midwest Outdoors, and especially you guys. So I want to thank you. I hope you guys get your fishing or hunting license for the year and start enjoying the nice weather that is on its way, even though in parts of the Midwest, I know it's going to feel like winter still for a few weeks. Until next time, guys, I'm Jim O'Neill. This is the Midwest Outdoors podcast, and we will see you guys on the water.